Please be seated as I pray. Father, you gave us your son. And those who know him are one with him. And they have life in him. And it is a joy and a privilege, an undeserved gift that you have given to us. Father, I pray that as we remember your son this morning, you would grant us your grace to be able to examine your word rightly, to see your son with the majesty and splendor that he deserves. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, this is the time in our service where we remember Jesus around his table. It's a time for Christians to remember Christ and what he did for them at the cross, where he gave his body and he gave his blood. In a moment, we're going to be taking a small wafer and a bit of juice, and these are symbols. It's important to know that what we take are symbols of Christ himself. Uh, the wafer is a symbol of his body, which was broken at the cross, and the small bit of juice is a symbol of his blood, which was shed at the cross. And this morning, we're going to be looking at a passage that describes Christ as the only one who is able to meet the standard of God's perfect law. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Colossians chapter 2? We're going to be looking at pages, uh, verses 13 and 14. If you don't have a Bible, there are some men coming down the aisles. They will get one to you. Just raise your hands. Um, and if you do not actually own a Bible, we would love you to keep this for yourself so that you can begin running God's word yourself. And if you have a pew Bible with you, um, the passage we're using today is on page 1063. This section of scripture is all about the preeminence of Christ, what Christ did, who Christ is, how Christ is sufficient. When you get to our passage, uh, verses 13 and 14, Paul brings two things into view for the church in Colossae. On the one hand, he brings into view God's perfect law, and on the other hand, there's the inability of a man to meet the standard of that perfect law. So look for those two things as I read our passage, starting in verse 13 of Colossians 2. And you being dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him, having graciously forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. He also has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. We see our condition before Christ in verse 13. You see a spiritual deadness. And our description there is that we're dead by our activity and we're dead by our nature. We're dead by our transgressions and by the uncircumcision of our flesh. Paul's helping us remember that in our natural born condition, up until Christ entered into our life, we were spiritually dead. And you see God's reconciling work at the end of that verse, that God made you alive with him. God overcame that spiritual deadness by making us alive and by graciously forgiving all of our transgressions. But the focus of our attention this morning is on verse 14, where we see how it is that God did this. God's law is a perfect standard. It is a holy standard. And no man, no woman, no child has the ability to stand up to and meet that standard. The response of a holy God to anybody who does not meet the standard of his law is right there in front of us. The law is hostile to us. You see God's mercy at the end of this verse, and this is where we want to put all of our attention. God took that certificate of debt, took that indebtedness that we have to his law out of the way. Because we are not capable of fulfilling the standard of God's law, God had to do something to satisfy the terms of his law. So he took the law away from us, took the condition of the law and the obligations and requirement of the law away from those who believe. And look what he did with it. He actually transferred that obligation, that requirement of that law, and he transferred it to Christ and he nailed it to the cross. If you look back a few verses to verse 9, you can see how it is that Christ was actually equipped to meet the conditions of God's perfect law. That's because that in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells. Because Christ is the Son of God, he does possess the righteousness of God. He possesses the ability to meet every term, every condition of God's perfect and holy law. He can do that for the believer when the believer is unable to do that for themselves. And Jesus 
demonstrated that by living a perfect life. Every day, every moment, every hour, every week, month, year of his life, from the day he was born until the day he went to the cross, he lived a perfect life. There was not one moment, not one day in which he ran into sin. Think of any season of life of your life. Think of any season of life of anyone and how we are so prone to sin, whether it's the youngest child or an adolescent or a teenager or a young adult or a fully grown man. We're prone to sin at every moment, every day. Christ was completely innocent. He satisfied. He proved himself to be the fullness of deity in bodily form by living a perfect life. So Christian today, when the elements come to you, take them and hold them and know that it is not your obligation. It is not your requirement to meet every term of God's perfect law because that obligation was moved to Christ and Christ fulfilled that because of who he is in Christ. Rejoice over that as you look back over the course of your last week and you see all of the ways in which you fell short of God's perfect standard. Know that Christ is your savior. He is your representative before God. He is the one who actually went to the cross in your place. He bore God's wrath against him so that you wouldn't have to. But more importantly today, he is your righteousness. He met the standard of God's law. If you're here this morning and you are not in Christ, you're not following Christ, you need to understand something. You need to understand that you don't have a representative before you who will fulfill the standard of God's law. God's law is given to every single person that he has made. It is our obligation to keep it. The one who turns to Christ and looks to Christ recognizes that they don't have the ability to fulfill that in themselves. And they trust that Christ, being the Son of God, will do that on their behalf. And he does and he will. If you're here and you don't know Christ, when the elements come to you, simply pass them on to the person next to you. This is a time for Christians to remember what God did for them in his son, Jesus Christ. But after the service, there will be somebody up here at the front to your left. They will have a Bible with them and they will have the testimony of their own life. They would love to show you how it is that you can know Christ. So men come and serve us. And then we've had a chance to, I will close our time in prayer.